Another topic in this realm of nutrition that we get asked about a lot, it seems there's a ton of confusion and we're going to very simplify it just for this conversation is an idea of like, is sugar poison? What's your thought on that? Oh, all the hits, Nick. Greatest hits right now, baby. <laughs> it is the greatest hits. That's why you can't agree to doing these things. We get to ask you all the stuff that you traditionally don't want to talk about on AMAs. Yeah. Again, a very loaded question, but I would argue that the question, the, is the premise of the question even logical, right? So what is a poison? Um, again, I, poison is a, is a, is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a word that, that speaks to a dose, speaks to a frequency, speaks to chronicity, uh, acuteness. I mean, all of these things, right? So, you know, broadly speaking, when I think of a poison, I'm thinking is something chronically a poison? Is it an acutely a poison? Okay. So let's, let's start with something that everybody has in their house, acetaminophen, Tylenol. Is it a poison? I mean, doesn't have a skeleton on the cover with like bones through it, right? I mean, it doesn't look like the, you know, Drano you have under your sink that is clearly marked as a poison. Um, tells you to take 500 to 1000 milligrams every four to six hours or whatever the instructions are. But what happens if you took 20 grams of that stuff, 20 times the dose? Well, you would be dead of liver failure in three days if someone wasn't able to pump your stomach in time or get you a liver transplant. So that sounds like a poison. Um, that's actually acutely quite toxic, right? Um, is alcohol a poison? It depends on the dose, right? Um, we've talked about and written about this at, at great length. There are clearly doses at which alcohol is quite toxic. Uh, it's neurotoxic. And um, again, there's, there's certainly a scenario where, you know, you have a glass of wine a few times a week and it would be almost impossible to discern or measure a negative effect of that. So I say all of those things just to kind of anchor people in what we're talking about. And I think this type of word, I think, I just think that the phrase sugar is poison is not helpful, right? Um, it's loaded, it's emotional, it's like, it's just, it's, it's sort of nonsensical, right? What we should really be asking, I think, is a, is a question that's more along the lines of what are the biochemical effects of sucrose or high fructose corn syrup or fructose in general at different doses and under different metabolic conditions? And understandably, that's a mouthful that nobody wants to say. So it's just easier to just say sugar is poison. But Again, I think this is an area where my view has changed quite a bit. Um, and it's changed because of the data, right? I, I just don't see the data to demonstrate that an isocaloric substitution of fructose for glucose is demonstrably worse for health outcomes if total energy intake is preserved. Now, does that mean that eating sugar in an unrestricted manner in a free living environment is of no consequence? No, it doesn't mean that at all. And it certainly appears that in at least a susceptible individual, a high consumption of fructose, and it seems even more clear in liquid fructose, can drive appetitive behavior. Meaning, to put that in English, if you're drinking a lot of sugar, it makes you want to eat more calories. Now, we can debate how many calories, and I believe that these data have been misrepresented. I think that these data have been misrepresented and overstated. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I think that in a free living environment, people will consume more energy if they have more access to sugar. But if you control for calories, and you, you may recall, I had this discussion on the podcast with Rick Johnson using what I think was probably one of the most robust experiments I had seen on this topic, given how long it lasted. And my recollection was it lasted nine months, which in mice is an eternity. 
under isocaloric conditions, when these mice were fed, um, when their total calories were controlled, and you had high fructose versus, versus low fructose groups, you did not see a statistically significant difference in body weight. Um, that's, that's a big deal. Now, would you see a statistically significant difference in metabolic parameters? I think you might if the fructose dose gets high enough. But this comes back to something I said at the outset, the dose makes the poison. And I think what's, what appears to be the case to me is that I don't think we know yet what that dose looks like as a function of the other parameters. So when I was young, when I was a teenager and I trained six hours a day, which I did, right? Like I was, I never ran less than eight miles in the morning. I mean, I was in the gym, like I, I, it was a training machine. I, 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 there's no way I was eating fewer than 200 grams of sugar a day, right? Like A, I mean, I just ate everything that was in front of me. I, I mean, I, I had... I would drink two liters of orange juice as my, you know, snack box. Other, other kids were drinking little juice boxes. I had a two liter can of orange juice. Um, I didn't eat bowls of cereal. I ate them a box at a time. So was I unhealthy? No chance, right? Like I probably had 4% body fat, um, but I was exercising six hours a day. So, so again, like the context matters. Now, if I ate that much food today, never mind sugar, I mean, you wouldn't even know my name anymore. I'd be dead, right? So um, everything about this is problematic because I think people want to focus on just one macronutrient, in this case, fructose or sugar uh, as a molecule. And we don't want to sort of focus on the overall dietary pattern that accompanies it. And um, so... I would say the following, if I was going to try to sum this up. When I consume fructose, which I do all the time, it, it's, it's generally in the form of fruit, right? Like I don't restrict my consumption of fruit. Um, I generally don't drink calories outside of protein shakes. Um, those happen to be sweetened with artificial sweeteners anyway these days. They're mostly like sucralose and things like that. Um, if I'm drinking a beverage, like the once or twice a month that I want kind of a carbonated beverage that's sweet, it's a diet Dr. Pepper as opposed to a Dr. Pepper. Okay. Would the Dr. Pepper kill me? No. But again, I'm only having like one a month, so it probably doesn't matter. But truthfully, Nick, that's more because of my teeth. Like what I really care more about is not putting an overall strain on my teeth than I do in the belief that sugar is somehow uniquely poisonous. Um, so, you know, I guess I do limit sugar intake. Um, but what you're, what you're hearing me kind of react to is not because I think sugar is poison, but I think that sugar as part of a, I think a high sugar diet is just a dietary pattern that is incongruent with eating the right kinds of foods that I generally want to eat anyway. I hope that makes sense and it's not too waffly, but I'll let you push back on it. No, I think it does. And I think even though you've talked about this so much, I think, and we can link to it where you go in more detail, but I think it would be helpful for people just how you look at nutrition. Do you want to give your quick two by two framework of, you know, metabolically healthy, unhealthy, that whole piece? So it kind of, I think paints a bigger picture on why you don't just look at sugar being toxic, poison, whatever it is, but how you kind of look more holistically. Because I think a, a lot of what you said there would relate to you because you are metabolically healthy and you know where you sit in that two by two framework. But if you have patients who maybe are metabolically unhealthy and they need to lose weight, they need to increase their muscle mass, you might not be so liberal with the sugar for them. Yeah. And, I, and I'll say this, like there's definitely an area where I'm still actively trying to investigate this and you know we'll even be doing a podcast on this topic right which is is there is there a unique role that fructose plays in the development of NAFLD um so non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is obviously you know running rampant right now um in in the world and 
one hypothesis is that it's not just energy imbalance, which is clearly associated with NAFLD. In other words, you take a person with NAFLD and they lose 20 pounds, their fatty liver is going to get better no matter what. Um, but then the question is, should those people be restricting fructose? Um, and again, lots of great mechanistic data for why fructose rather than glucose would disproportionately play a role in the development of NAFLD. And I think there's even more compelling evidence for why liquid fructose is potentially playing a greater role. But what I haven't seen yet is a really compelling clinical trial that can demonstrate that independent of weight loss, um, isocaloric substitution of fructose for glucose results in an improvement of um, NAFLD. That said, if I have patients with NAFLD, we're going to tell them not to drink alcohol and not to consume fructose out of, you know, mild amounts of fruit. So again, we're making a recommendation that is not necessarily one for which we would have incredible evidence, but we're saying, look, even if nothing else, that change in behavior reduces in less caloric intake, which also results in weight loss. Ultimately, that's what we care about. And then just to kind of end that little piece, do you want to just walk through your two by two framework for nutrition? Again, we'll link to places you talk about in more detail, but I think it's just helpful for people who maybe aren't familiar to have that anchoring. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really three questions and it's, you know, kind of is a person overnourished or undernourished? Um, and you know, that's determined by total amount of body fat and visceral fat. Are they adequately muscled or under muscled? looking at things like fat-free mass index or appendicular lean mass index, and then are they metabolically healthy or not? And so by understanding the answer to those questions, you, you pretty quickly can come up with a point of view on how a person needs to train and how a person needs to eat, and maybe even in some cases, how you want to tweak their macronutrients. Mm -hmm.